Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome in this afternoon. It's a pleasure to have you here. Very excited about our speaker tonight. So my name, for those of you who don't know, is James Otteson. I'm a faculty member here in the business school. I also have the privilege of serving as the executive director of the university's new Eudaimonia Institute. That is how it is pronounced, Eudaimonia. That is Aristotle's word meaning flourishing or happiness. The institute exists in order to encourage the study of the institutions, which include the political, economic, moral, cultural institutions that can enable a truly flourishing and humane life. Um, we're very happy to have our speaker here today, who is Chris Wright. Chris grew up, grew up in Colorado. He's a passionate outdoorsman, loves hiking, backpacking, climbing, cycling, skiing, but he's also had a longtime passion for science and energy, which is what he's gonna be talking to us about today. After studying mechanical engineering at MIT, he became an entrepreneur in technology and energy. At age 27, he founded Pinnacle Technologies. So some of you I know are nearing 27, so this gives you some standard to set. He founded Pinnacle Technologies, which developed commercialized technologies for the first, that for the first time allowed direct, I have to read this because I've got to make sure I get this correct direct measurement of how hydraulic fractures actually grow deep underground. These direct measures, measurements dramatically increase the understanding of how fractures behave. In 2000, Chris co-founded one of the first shale gas production companies, Stroud Energy it was called. He served as chairman of Stroud while remaining president and CEO of Pinnacle. Right before a 2006 IPO, Stroud was acquired by Range Resources, and also in 2006, he turned over the reins at Pinnacle to a colleague and spent, I have to get a kick out of this, most of the next three years coaching his kids' sports teams, bike racing and traveling with his family, including to a couple of trips to New Guinea. Apparently he got a little bored with that. Um, in 2010, he co-founded Liberty Resources, which employs these fracturing innovations to produce oil in the Bakken Shale in North Dakota. And in 2011, he co-founded Liberty Oil Field Services, which is a hydraulic fracturing company, which provides fracturing services and innovations to other oil and gas producers in North Dakota, Wyoming, Colorado, and Texas. So in addition to being the CEO of both of those companies, um, he's on the board of several other companies and nonprofits with a focus on education, poverty, and the environment. Mr. Wright's talk this afternoon is, is entitled Energy, Where Did It Come From and Where Is It Going? An Entrepreneur's Story. Please join me in welcoming Chris Wright. Thanks, Jim, and th thanks everyone for being here. I'll say right up front, the bio is way more formal than I am, and um, I actually had sort of in mind a little bit more of a free form. I'm gonna tell my story of live, some of the stuff about businesses, some other thoughts, and hopefully stir the pot for questions and dialogue. Um, I'll say, first of all, why I'm here. Um, I'm here because of the guy that just introduced me. Um, and that's a philosophy I'm gonna talk about business and life. If you partner with the right people, that's how you get a happy life and success in business. So that's something I learned early on. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But uh, I'm a big fan of sort of what we call classical liberalism, you know, you think, David Hume, John Locke, Adam Smith, sort of the founders who believed in this idea of human freedom that ultimately led to the modern world. And I, I think maybe the most important of the, of the classical liberals is Adam Smith. And so I, I highly recommend to everyone to read both of his fantastic books, The Theory of Moral Sentiments and The Wealth of Nations. Um, but uh, Professor Otzen wrote, in my mind, the best book on Adam Smith's thought. It's in modern English. It's a lot shorter than the two tomes that Smith wrote, um, although they're worth it. But uh, Professor Otzen's book is fantastic, and you'll get an idea into this man and these incredible insights that really catalyze the creation of the modern world. And, and, I'll, and I'll come back to that. I'm going to talk about a microcosm myself uh, first. But my, myself, first of all, I was sitting in, sitting in a chair just like you are 30-some years ago. At, at university, and I remember thinking to myself then, you know, what am I going to do? Where am I going? You know, you, no idea. That's, that's normal. Life to me just sort of happens. Life for me very much happened. It was not a master plan. It was not any great thoughts. It just, it just happened. But I'll qualify that to say, first of all, I was crazy lucky. 
you know, born in the United States, born in the United States of the modern world, where there's property rights and freedom and enough wealth to fly around the world and see and do stuff. It's, it, it's only very recently that way, and it's not that way for everyone. Um, you know, I had, a, I had a fantastic mother and wonderful siblings. I got a fabulous wife and daughter. My son's not here. So, you know, you got to preface kind of where you, where you come from. I, I'm, a, I'm a crazy, lucky guy. I grew up in uh, Denver, Colorado. Um, as you said, I liked the outdoors. I was a tennis player and, you know, liked, liked all the stuff kids do as, as young. But my, my, my interest beyond that, you know, were two things, were science and history. You know, I always wondered, you know, you'd see things in the news or in TV about a primitive society in Africa and the Amazon, and I'm like, you know, why are they like that and we're like this and what were our ancestors like? So I've, I've had this passion for history my whole life, and that's mo most of my reading has been on history, but also on science. You know, I was a science geek turned tech nerd. Um, so I knew I wanted, I was going to study something related to science and engineering. And when I grew up in the early 1980s, at that time, sort of the, the, the mania or the meme of society was that we're running out of resources. We're going to run out of oil in 15 years and natural gas in 10. Metal, you know, the base metals that we need for in industrialization, they're running out. We're not going to have enough fertilizer. Soon all the arable land in the world will be planted with food and we'll have mass starvation because population is growing fast. And this, this wasn't a fringe idea. This was sort of mainstream thought in the, in the 70s and early 80s. So as a kid, I was, I was very affected by that. And um, as I'll talk later, my two, my two uh, passions, besides you know, technology and doing something with it, was this issue of poverty I'll come back to at the end. You know, why was I so lucky? Why aren't other people lucky? Can't they be lucky too? And so energy to me kind of combined these things, you know, to, 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 to leave a, a, tra a traditional society where all the energy is 100% renewable, it's all biomass, burning trees, grass, sticks, and dung, um, to join the modern world. Uh, other things change, but your use of energy changes dramatically. And so if that was true when I was a kid that we're about to run out of energy, that was a, that was a scary thought for what that would mean for the world and for what it would mean for me personally. My brother and I were mountain climbers. We had these dreams. We wanted to go around the world and climb, climb high mountains, other places, and we've been very lucky and, and able to do that. But at the time, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, if we're going to be out of energy before the year 2000, by the time I've got enough money to travel and do stuff, um, this won't happen. So those, those things, those, those memes around when you're young, they, they affect you. And it's one of the reasons I went to MIT. You know, I, I, I was born in New Jersey. I love to say I'm a native Colorado, and everyone in Colorado says you speak way too fast to be from Colorado. So I was born in, in New Jersey, just across from New York City, moved to Colorado when, when I was six, and I uh, really grew up in the suburbs of Denver. Um, but uh, so in, in any case, so looking at this sort of tragedy, you know, or potential energy crisis, it didn't happen. It's, it's, it's maybe not in the fronts of minds anymore, but it, but it was then. One of the... But I liked the West, you know, so I moved from New Jersey when I was six. I was in Colorado. I was thinking if I was going to go to college in Colorado or maybe out on the West Coast. Um, by strange coincidence, I tore the ACL in my knee um, at a graduation party for the grade ahead of me. So the end of my junior year, I tore my ACL. I was working landscaping at the time, you know, so you couldn't push a, push a mower and, and cut trees and bushes and all that with a torn ACL. So my mom said, hey, go back east, go back east. You know, she was from New England originally. Go back east and stay with my brother and go look at MIT and Harvard. Uh, you know, I'm not going east to Colorado, but I had torn ACL. I went back. Um, I visited the MIT campus in the morning, and then I was going to Harvard in the afternoon. But something about it, um, and you probably had, some of you probably had it when you walked on the Wake campus. Um, for me, it was only one data point, so maybe it wasn't a good decision. But I walked around MIT, and I'm like, this is it. This is where I want to go to college. So by, I went to Harvard in the afternoon. I wasn't even interested by then. I, I knew where I was going. I only applied one place, and I was going to MIT. But part of that also was they had these Alcator tokamaks. How about that for a, for a techie word? And it's basically, think a donut with badass mag, magnets on it. And the idea was inside there to confine a plasma, which is basically just gaseous atoms when they're separated from their electrons, um, to create fusion. 
And what fusion is, fusion is what powers the sun. It's what powers all of the stars, and it's 99.999% of all the energy in the universe it comes from high pressure and high temperature that squeeze together hydrogen atoms, and they combine and form helium, and that releases a huge amount of energy. So again, look, look, at, look at the sun. Think how that's burning, and that's going to burn that way for somewhere 5 to 10 billion years. Um, so that's, that's a dense energy source. And there was research underway already to work on fusion energy. And as a kid, I thought, you know, that's a problem. We're going to solve that problem. And that'll fix this impending energy crisis. Um, then it was sort of viewed as maybe 20 years away. And here we are 35 years later. And it's sort of viewed as maybe 20 years away. And, and 30 years from now, it probably will be too. Very, very hard problem. Personally believe, it, 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 look how ingenious humans are. It, it will be solved. It'll be a role, but you know, maybe that's 50 or 100 years away. But more importantly for me, when I got there, I got a job in the, in the Fusion Research Center in a lab. And, um, but I very quickly realized, it was, I, I thought I was a scientist or an aspiring scientist. I realized I didn't have the patience you know, to work in a lab. It, it's incredibly important stuff. But it's painstaking. It takes a long time to set up an experiment. A little screw up here breaks it, and you got to fix it. So it's a it's a it's a lot of work and a lot of patience. Um, and I was I, I wasn't given the the rhythm gene. I can't dance, and I wasn't given the patient gene. So I, I miss I miss those two. Um, so I realized maybe 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 that isn't for me. I want I want to be uh, applied science. So again, no, knowing nothing else, I I decided to study engineering. Um, and then after my first year of, of college, you go and you got to get a summer job, right? And I, I had worked, uh, one thing I didn't say about my story, I, I'm sticking with the crazy lucky, but the one thing that did impact my life a little bit is my dad was an alcoholic before I was born and to this day. And so I didn't grow up in some terrible rough household. Again, my mom was an angel, wonderful kids. But the guy who earned the money and sort of controlled our financial situation, you know, wasn't, wasn't the most generous character. And so that drove in me a desire for independence. It probably did have a big impact on my career. You know, as a kid, you know, I got a job picking weeds and the stuff we all did as young. But I wanted to make enough money so I could buy my skateboard. I could, I could buy a tennis racket. I was a tennis player. I wanted to ski. And so I, to me, Work was a, was a way to independence as well. I ended up graduating from high school a year early, and I went through college a year. I went through college in three years as well, partially driven by the fact that to be independent from my dad. My last check I got from my dad, I was 19 years old, paid for my last year of college. I went to graduate school in engineering because it's a low-paid job. You know, they pay your tuition, they pay you a monthly salary, and you know, sort of you're on your own. But, but a few years before that, after my freshman year, I got a job. First time I'd worked indoors, I got a job at Honeywell, you know, big, great industrial technology company. And, um, and it's right when laser printers were about to come out. This technology was being developed. It was going to be one of these new printing technologies. Uh, there was another printing technology, thermal printer, which is basically you have like a sheet of ink that rolls together with a sheet of paper and then a little head that heats up in certain places basically, and melts the ink onto the paper. So thermal printing, uh, the big race between thermal and laser printers. And the last time I was unlucky in my life, I got stuck on the thermal printer team. And I didn't know I was unlucky. I didn't know who was going to win that race. But so we're on this team. And, and at the company, it was six months to develop a manufacturable prototype. Um, so I worked in the summer. I came back and worked a little bit at Christmas. Um, and what I got out of that, though, there was nine people on this team. But there were two people. I, I have not seen them since, which is ridiculous. I should track them down. But a guy named Doug Beatty and another guy named Mike McNitt, they were both sort of late 20s, so two, uh, the two youngest members on the team. And when we got to this final printer product, 80-plus uh, percent was done by those two guys. And the other. 15 or 20% was done by the other seven on the team. So as a crazy competitive guy, when I was mowing lawns and landscaping, I wanted to make sure I mowed faster than everyone. And you know, as a math nerd, I'm 15% faster than him. And you know, this guy's a loafer. I'm 40% faster than him. I looked at these guys, and I'm like, these, these two 
guys are worth 10 times more. They're more valuable to this team than, than the others. And that, at, at that young age, I said, all right, now I know what I'm going to be. I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I have no idea what I'm going to make or do, but if you only had people like those two guys, um, you could probably do something special. And again, at that time, I was 18 years old. I did, I did not know what. You know, I was going to stumble along and figure it out. But I've been an entrepreneur since that time. I've, I've never worked for a company with more than 10 employees that I didn't start since then. So I worked for a couple little companies, which was super helpful right after I, well, I was in graduate school and right after graduate school. But I got, so in any case, so I had this dream, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to figure out what, what to do. I stumbled along with mechanical engineering undergrad. I went to graduate school in electrical engineering. No reason, but hey, that's different. I briefly, hilariously, I got into the oil and gas business in the one semester I spent at UC Berkeley. I left MIT. I decided to go to graduate school at UC Berkeley. I showed up at the end of my first month. I was a TA. I showed up at the end of my first month for my paycheck, $862 a month. I'm on my own now. Um, I'm pretty excited about it. And I show up, and they don't have my check. Oh, no, we don't have a check for you. Pull out my student ID, and I said, whatever. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, you're in the system. Uh, sorry, we, you know, we, we, didn't, we don't have your check. I'm like, oh, I can wait. No, no, we only do a check run once a month. Do a check, we'll give you two next month. What about this month? We'll give you two next month, you know, so, sorry about that. And uh, I remember just, and it, as not a patient guy, I'm biting my lip. I didn't, I didn't make a big scene, but I walked out of there thinking, wow, you know, I, I've got 30 days of bills and life and all that, and I, and I don't have my check. And so I called up this gal um, who I'd met two years beforehand, and Liz was an uh, undergrad at Stanford at the time. And, um, and I said, I got to get a job. And she said, hey, I worked at a summer job, you know, organizing this tiny company, trying to get automated on Excel or whatever on, on spreadsheets and, and do the business. And, oh, man, this guy needs help. You know, call him up. And uh, so I did. And, um, and, and, and I got a job. I worked there every Friday. So I, I didn't teach on Fridays. I had a class on Friday. I just missed my class. I drove from Berkeley, California, down to Mountain View, so almost an hour drive. But... It more than doubled my income. I made another thousand dollars a month, and to me, this was this was invigorating. Now, you know, now I could, now I could do, I could travel, I could do the things I wanted to do while I was a student. And um, I, I, may, may, I don't think it was just the check thing, but after a semester, I thought maybe I don't like Berkeley as much, and I went back to graduate school at MIT. But I kept working as a consultant for this little company called Hunter Geophysics, and so. And what, what Hunter Geophysics did, think of a carpenter's level, right? You put it on as your table flat. Um, it's the same idea. It's a little bubble. It's a, it's, well, it's a glass case that's bent, and it's got a bubble in it and a liquid in it, right? So for gravity, the bubble goes up. And then there's some electrodes mounted on it so it could tell very small deflections of the surface. It turns out you could measure, uh, with, a with the next generation, we could measure tilt down to one part in a billion. So if you had a beam you know, from New York City to LA and someone lifted one end by a quarter inch, you could see that tilt. And so this guy was trying to use that deflection at the surface to infer what was happening underground. You know, if magma is flown into a volcano, the ground should bulge up, and it does. Um, and so it was these, you know, this is nothing I knew, knew nothing about, but to me it was kind of this combination of a technology that had some interest. Well, number one, it was paying me money. But then as I worked on it, it was just interesting. And it was a young, it was a, not young, it was an entrepreneur who had a lot of passion. He had a lot of idea. He had a lot of shortcomings. That's probably one of my biggest mistakes. I never had a mentor, you know, who, who could show me how to do things right. I mostly learned how to do things wrong. And then I did things wrong for a long time. And eventually, if you keep walking, you'll, you'll stumble into the right direction. But uh, I, worked, I, I worked there, and when I in graduate school, trying to understand what they're doing, what their customers wanted. I had to go, and it turned out their biggest application was in the oil and gas business. You know, people are doing a hydraulic fracture, pumping fluid underground. You know, you want to know where it's going. Are you producing oil out of the ground? Is it coming from here or here? Or where is it going? 
So they were technologies. I knew nothing about oil and gas production. Never thought, I, I, I knew when I was in high school, we we're running out of oil and gas. I'm not, I'm not gonna work in that field. Um, but it turned, it, 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 again, not by design, turned out I was, I was in that field. Um, and I ended up working, I don't tell the details, I ended up working with another, this guy at the end of the day, when you're measuring something deep underground, there were certain things we could measure and, and, and much more things we couldn't measure. And if someone wanted to pay for what we could measure, you know, all was good. We had to convince them and negotiate a price. But mo most people wanted to know things that our technology simply couldn't see. And this guy who started the company, at the end of the day, if he couldn't get the sale, he would tell them, oh yeah, we, we can measure that too. Just let us put out more instruments or you know, do something different. But essentially, it was lying. You know, he was, hey, he'd get the work. They didn't know he was lying. If you're telling someone what happens a mile underground, nobody can see. True, you know, nobody can direct, no, one's, no one can go a mile underground and see if you were right or wrong. So it was a business, as many businesses are. When you use a business, you know, a bank, they hold your money and they transfer it all around. You, you don't know how that works, but you trust them. And people in our society, it's a relatively high trust society. society. People originally trusted him. But uh, to many people, he was lying. He was lying. And I just, I don't want any part of that. So when I learned that, um, I, I was going to leave. But then there was a guy who had invested in the company. And he said, hey, let's try to buy him out. This was a tiny company. You know, it was a million dollars a year and losing money every year. It had six or seven employees. Um, in, in any case, we tried to buy this guy out. I had no money, but another guy who had invested, we tried to buy him out. That didn't work. Ended up working with crazy guy number two, who's a professor at MIT. He was a very smart guy. We developed a, 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 like a predictive model of how hydraulic fractures grow. Um, this was all new to me, but, but quite fun. And then uh, after three years of that, I figured it's got to be something, you know, that uh, maybe I'm ready to do this on my own and try to, you know, because if you go into any company, there's sort of a legacy of, you know, how, how people do things, who's there and all that. And I finally maybe had the courage that I, I got to go just start, start from new. But my, my most important lesson was that one back at Honeywell, which was just that if, if you get the right people, it's both a combination of get the right people and have the right incentives. I, I, I say if I have two general, general comments about business uh, to, to succeed in business, Number one, and the biggest one by far, is be nice. If you're going to do business with people, who do you, who do you want to buy? You know, when you go to a coffee shop, who do you want to buy from? Someone who's nice, someone who engages you, someone who's honest. If they screw up and make you the wrong coffee, they, they make you the right one and they give it to you. You know, those things are, are, are the same in bigger scale in business. If you treat people well, if you treat people honestly, and you always do what you say you're going to do. We all screw up. But if you screw up and you make it right, everyone remembers that. Everyone remembers that. Um, and the other is, so be nice. And, and, the, and the second one is incentives matter. Incentives drive human behavior. You know? And so that's, that's how you partner with people, what you do. In my, in my original company, the, the gal who was at the front, the desk at the front and answered the phones, she had stock options in our company. She wasn't leaving. She cared about the success of this business, and she was motivated by the success of this business. Um, and so in there, and I made a million mistakes along the way. Number one is I'm an optimist, and I think probably most entrepreneurs are optimistic. You know, so I hired, I hired a guy. I remember him very well. He was a you know, nice enough guy. And um, he didn't seem 100% there, but he was actually just graduating from Stanford. Oh, God, he must be a smart guy. I mean, you know, he, he must be a good guy. I have a tiny little company. I need some young guys or gals, you know, to go after it. And um, he wasn't a very hard worker. And uh, I tried to tell Todd, man, everybody else is working hard. You got to say, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll step it up a bit. Um, and... When we would travel, you know, we would drive down to Bakersfield, California from San Francisco, and you had to hire a, someone who drills water wells, you know, and drill a 15-foot hole in the ground, you know, with someone's rig, and then lower an instrument into it and surround it by sand. I mean, it's out in the field working with people and making stuff happen. 
And uh, Todd would go down, and then he'd put things on his expense report. Um, you know, we're not going to buy alcohol or cigarettes. No company's going to buy that when you, when you go travel. And yeah, he, put, he re repeatedly would put that on there, you know, hope, hope no one noticed, so he'd get 15 extra bucks or something. Um, and so for, at the start, I just kept talking to him, like, you can't do that. You can't do that. And, um, and I had a company maybe of like nine people then. But I've got eight people that are working really hard. You know, they're, they, and they're my partners. People in your business, they're your partners. They're my partners. But Todd would always cut a corner. If he was the only one out in the field, he wouldn't get the job done because maybe when the next person came out, they could do it. Um, if there was an easier way to do something no one could see underground, I'll just cover it up with sand and, you know, this instrument's not, not working. And I, I, I did a big disservice to everyone else on the team because they're all, all in, giving it their best. And one person who's cutting corners, trying, essentially lying to the company on his expense reports, um, they all knew we should get rid of Todd. Why is Todd still around? I was the last one to learn that lesson. You know, oh, come on, and just sit him down, and you know, he'll, he's not much younger than I am. But you think, we like to think everybody, you just talk to them straight, and they'll get going. But uh, one thing I've learned, not to, be, not to be a fatalist, is that character generally mostly gets formed at a young age. If your kids are great coming out of junior high, they're, they're, you know, they're, 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 that character is most, mostly formed. But I, I didn't believe that at all. I thought, ah, oh, everybody's got flaws. Believe me, I've got a giant list of flaws. But I thought I could fix the sort of character flaws of some of the people I hired. And it held the business back. And I had people that worked, worked their butts off and then uh, think something didn't work, you know, because Todd cut a corner. They all knew that. Finally, you know, I took this guy and told him that, you know, that was enough and let him go. It was his best day. Oh, he agreed. He knew he was the worst guy in the team. He knew he cut corners. He knew whatever. But, hey, he did it, and he still had a job. You know, he, he, he I liked him so much more the day I fired him because um, he knew all his problems. But... He either wasn't going to fix them, or I didn't give him enough and sent him to fix them, and so we, we fired him. And I learned from there, or the message I took out of that was that pe you can teach people a new programming language, or they can learn a new set of physics or a new set of instrumentation. Human minds are amazing. But, but when you're an adult, you're out of college, and you're in the work world, not many people change their character after that. I should say not none, not none, but most people, their character what, what, what drives their human behaviors? It's formed. And there are people that if no one's looking, they'll do something different. You know, they'll inflate what they did. You know, if they can do something, if they can do something when no one's, they act differently when no one's looking, you know, that's a, that's a character flaw. And, but if you only, and of course in a big company, you got the bell curve. In most businesses you do. But if you hire, and my, my, my thing, first I thought I wanted smart engineers or whatever, I wanted this. What I learned in maybe those first five or 10 years was by far and away the most important characteristic for anyone we hired was that a good person? You know, was that gal honest? Would she, does she behave the same whether someone's looking or no one's looking? You know, does she want to support her employee? If she made a mistake, no, no, that was mine, not, you know, not so-and-so. You know, I, I think there's a huge amount of people wired that way. But if you, if you build a group of humans, whether it's to go on a climbing expedition or a traveling trip, you know, or a business, that are all good people, good people, um, it is amazing, amazing what can be done. Um, as I said, look, I'm a crazy, naive guy. I never studied business. I never worked at a good business. I made a very long list of mistakes. But I, I got probably only mostly about one thing right, which was get really good humans on the team and treat them like they're really good humans. You know, they're, they're all part owners in the business. We give everyone the benefit of the doubt. And my, I, the service company I run now, we have 1,000 employees. We have no vacation policy. I don't care when someone shows up and when they leave. The goal is to win. The goal is to do stuff great. And if you have only people on the team, that that's their goal too. You know, they, they got to manage, you know, your kid's got a soccer game at 2 p.m., go to the soccer game. You can get your work done later. Um, you manage. You're, you're in charge of this part of the business. 
you get that done great. You schedule it out so someone's covering you when you're gone for that two weeks to go to Machu Picchu in Peru or whatever. You know, a business becomes part of your life. If it's miserable and you're just grinding out the hours and vacation is, you know, go lie on a beach and recover, you know, how, how long would you do that or how fulfilled would your life be if that was it? So a big thing for me is it's, it's intense. We're not, you know, it's not a party atmosphere, but it's a fun atmosphere and we're intense. We want to win, but we don't sweat the little things. We don't sweat the little things. But again, my, the, the, you know, I've been in various different businesses. A lot of them, I didn't even know that much about them. But there's very smart people and very good people out there that do know something about them. If you can bring them in and make them work on a team. The other thing is they're super skilled people. You all know them, you know, but they're, they're a pain in the ass, you know, or they're jerks. Um, and, and, and they're going to be good at something, and, you know, they may be fine. But... I don't want them on my team, and you probably don't want them on your team. Because if, you if, you, if you hire based on people that are nice and people that are honest, um, the rest of stuff, you've got to worry about the rest of the stuff. But you're so much in a better situation to make that succeed. Um, that, uh, and again, this isn't just for entrepreneurs. When you go in life, you go to work for a company, you know, we think of the the name, you know, is it, you know, Pfizer or Bristol Meyer, and they're very different businesses. But ultimately, when you go in, you're going to work for that team of humans that are in the group you're in. Your work experience is going to be largely dictated by those people around you. Now, at a big company, you may move up and get promoted, but if you if you you go visit a bunch of different companies and you find a place where I love those people, you know, they love what they're doing, they're hard work, and I think they're good people. I trust what they say to me. That's, that's a huge, huge plus. Um, well, I, I didn't really like them. They weren't very nice. It seems like a weird atmosphere, but boy, they offered me more money. Um, that, you know, that's, that's not likely to turn out very well. Um, I wanted to, and, and I, look, I was going to talk about energy, a little bit about life. I'm going to stop for a second. What's of interest? Yes. Um, so, sorry, writing down my questions as you talk. Um, you just said something about honesty and trust. And I'm wondering, like, in an interview process, I feel like a lot of people aren't necessarily like, oh, yeah, hey, like, you know, I didn't make as good grades as I could have. Or I, you know, I, I should have done more or something like that. But, like, would you appreciate if someone you know, was honest in an interview, even if it wasn't flattering, because I feel like most people in a, like in a job sense, they're, they're going to try and put their, their best foot forward and maybe, you know, put, put the sprinkles on top of the cupcake instead of just giving it plain like it would be. <laughs> like, that's just the analogy that I'm thinking of. No, and I, I, think, I think that's totally true. We all want to put our best foot forward. Um, and, and, I, and I think you need to put your best foot forward. But when you're honest, particularly honest about the things that are unflattering, right? It's, well, it's easy to be honest to say, yeah, I won the tennis tournament. You know, that, that's not hard to be honest. But to say, hey, you know, I was no good, but my partner was way better and carried me. That's why I won. That, that honesty, immediate respect. Immediate respect. I, I, I think saying something honest and unflattering about yourself, it, it, for me as a human, hugely positive in an interview. Hugely positive. That's, that's a character sign. That's a character sign. And, and again, an interview is always hard. What we do is we'll have someone come. You know, they'll talk to four or five people. They'll go out to lunch with a couple more. My whole thing is, and people get in a different setting. You know, I'm, I'm the old guy, but they go out to lunch with some gals in our office that are two years older than you, you know, and, and you're more likely to open up or talk honestly to them. And, you know, and then after the fact, we all get together. Is this, you know, is this gal, is this gal the real deal, or what? You know, anybody got any concerns? And our judgment is always a bunch of different reads, a bunch of different reads, because it's hard. You know, I've certainly hired people that, boy, they sounded great in an interview, and um, and they weren't. But you know, it's 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 hard to tell that. I would say how we hire is a little bit weird. We mostly hire people that someone in the company already knows, um, or we hire people that someone in the company knows someone who knows them. You know, because a resume or grades or whatever, I mean, certainly there are signs of achievement and, 
you know, and, th and there's things we get out of them. But the most important knowledge by far is to talk to someone who they used to work with or, you know, were in grad school with or, in, I mean, that's how you really know. And say, oh my God, I'm crushed, that gal's leaving, but you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, I wanna hire her, because you know, that's the person who was just with her for you know, two or three years. So those kind of personal references. And then of course it depends who's giving the reference, but you can get a vibe for people you know, from that, from that. If there's, a, if there's no connection, and that's how entrepreneur, when you're hired, trying to hire somebody, what you said you look for <coughs> honesty, good character. Yes. Um, how would you how would you find that from that person, or how would you know that know their character when you're trying to hire someone? Yeah. So if you do, if you don't know someone, and we do hire a lot of people we don't know, um, you know the biggest thing we do is we call references. We call references, and you know references they'll never say anything bad. It's sort of a goofy thing now. If you, if you worked at a company, and I call them up. And they say, oh man, that, you know, that guy's a loafer. It, that, that person who gets said about that will sue that company. So essentially, it's nearly impossible to get a bad reference from someone. But if you call them up and they say, and I did, I had an experience. I called up, a guy listed his former employer, and I called him up and they said, well, we can tell you he began work you know, on June of 1994 and was no longer employed on September 96. I know what that means, you know, so, so people, so g the biggest thing is calling references and getting a vibe. For people straight out of college, you, know, you don't often have a good reference. Um, and so there it's just spend time with them, spend time with them. We often do a thing, with that, that's what, in my company for engineers, for people, we have interns, you know, and the, the point of an internship for us is to see what the people are about. You know, we get a bunch of interns in, we give everybody projects, um, but, they're there for two or three months. You kind of get a sense of the characters, and, and everybody knows. These are the two we want to hire. You know? The other two are really nice and you know, whatever. But you know, yeah, I think you really don't know until you're, until you're around people. Professor Watson. Like Jim, I call him. Yes, that's why I'd like to ask you a question about energy, if I may. Yes. So you are in the hydraulic fracturing business, which yes. some people call fracking. Yes. Is that the same business? Yes. OK. Um, so there are a lot of people who have genuine concerns about that industry, in particular, the effects that it might have on the environment. Um, and one of the concerns that I've heard people talk about is the, um, the incidents, or potential incidents, you probably know more about it than I do, of earthquakes that this might be creating. Could you speak to the environmental impact of fracturing and what you see as the, uh, as the overall benefit or value you think the industry provides to the world? Absolutely, absolutely. So I'll step back. The short answer on earthquakes is yes, we do cause earthquakes. Um, and I'll explain and elaborate on that more in a second. Um, but so the idea is, the, the, the quick sort of primer on oil and gas, um, which I never learned in college, so you kids will all be way ahead of me. Um, but it isn't, unfortunately, it isn't the dinosaurs that became oil and gas. Very disappointed. They aren't, they aren't what oil and gas is. Oil and gas all comes from animals that lived in the oceans, mostly single cellular tiny microorganisms that lived in the oceans hundreds of millions of years ago, and then they die. And then they float down to the, they float down to the bottom. And if it's, a, if it's an energetic ocean where the water's moving around a lot, there's oxygen mixed up in that, in that water, and that oxygen breaks down that thing like your dead cat on the rat, if they'd sit outside, Oxygen, uh, it gets broken down and decomposed. But if it falls down in a quiet ocean, it's not, the water's pretty still, a stagnant sea, and so there's not a lot of oxygen mixed in, and it lands at the bottom of the ocean, and some small grain rocks like silt or shale that you, you think of as like a counter, a kitchen countertop is made out of, if that sediment comes in from a stream or a river going to the ocean, fine-grained sediment goes down and sits on top of that thing, it gets sealed. So it does not break down by normal matters. It doesn't get mixed with oxygen. And so that living organism gets sealed up in an anoxic environment. And then as time, more sediments come down. This is the 100 million year part. More sediments come down. You know, the Earth is dynamic. Eventually, this gets buried, say, two or three miles underground. And it cooks. 
It's under high pressure. As you go down on the ground, it's under high temperature. And that, that biologic matter gets broken down. It eventually turns into a subject, subject, substance called kerogen. And then it turns into, think, tar, like heavy, goopy oil. So it's still long molecule chains. Eventually, as it cooks, it turns into what we call light oil, which think gasoline, kind of like gasoline. And if it keeps cooking with time, eventually it'll all break down into methane. One carbon, four hydrogens around it. We're made out of carbon, hydrogen, and water. We get broken down into these simple hydrocarbon chains. So to, to form, it has to be, it has to be produced in a imperme nearly impermeable rock. If it was in beet sand at the bottom of an ocean, the oxygen will churn in there and it'll decompose. It's only if it got buried in the presence of nearly impermeable rock, which we call shale. So almost all oil and gas is produced in shales. And then as it cooks, that oil chain, it differentially cooks. Some part of it's still oil, but gas, natural gas starts to get formed. And if you take a solid and turn it into a gas, there's a huge increase in volume, right? So the pressure builds up. And nature creates these little hydraulic fractures. The pressure goes up, the rock cracks, volumetrically expands, and you make a crack. It could be 20 microns long. It could be a millimeter long. And a whole bunch of these cracks get formed in shale. And, it, and for most shales, this hasn't even happened yet. But all those cracks form. And then the oil and gas now has a way out of this impermeable rock. And it starts to float up. Because if I, if I drill a well right here two miles underground, it's going to be just like I'm in, in the ocean two miles underground. It's going to be 4,000 PSI of water pressure. All rocks, I used to think they were underground pools of oil. Once you get below soil, everything underground is a rock. But most rocks have little void spaces in them, pores. They, they, those pores are all full of water, except in the rare places where there's a little bit of oil or natural gas, you know, or some places CO2, but mostly it's water. So as these, as these natural hydraulic fractures grow, eventually they connect up. And, and since oil and gas are lighter than water, they seep up. They float out of the shales. And, and if there's permeable rock, they keep floating up until they hit another impermeable rock barrier, and they get trapped. So oil and gas before was finding places where there's rocks that are bent like this. So we're looking two miles underground. Some places rocks are flat. Some places the rocks are bent, you know, you know it's a volcano or just a plate tectonics. Things lift up, rocks are bent. So you drill down to these high points and hope there's oil and gas there. That's the first 140 years of the oil and gas industry. Because you can't get it out of shales. It's nearly impermeable. And then what happened in the late 1990s, and again, in, in mostly in a case of blind squirrel finds nut, with these technologies we developed that could see how fractures could grow, we came up with some ideas about maybe instead of getting one fracture, since I, I say fractures don't like fractures. When, when I'm pushing open the rock, if there's a frack over here, it, it, gets, it gets pushed closed. So if you can create multiple fractures, they grow away from each other, and you can create a network. So that's probably getting way too techy. But in any case, we came up with an idea that maybe Maybe you could, people are trying to produce oil and gas straight out of shales, because that's where 98% of it is. Instead of having to find it, just go to where we know it is. And um, so there was long trial and effort error. We had a couple ideas that helped. So in the uh, end of 97 was sort of the first time we were getting commercial amounts of natural gas directly out of the source rock. So instead of Mother Nature to create all the fractures and leak up and get stuck somewhere, just going right into the shales and bringing our own, I call it plumbing, install our own plumbing underground so we can put a dense enough fracture network in the shale so that it can all, you have a long, you, you drill down two miles, maybe the shale's 50 feet thick, you drill a well, steering it from the surface in this 50 foot zone, two miles long, and then inject water out of multiple points in this well to create enough fractures so that you can get a commercial quantity of oil and natural gas out of shale. And so hydraulic fracturing as a, you know, a process for oil and gas production actually started in 1949. So when I was in graduate school in 1985, you know, it was a 35-year-old thing. Um, 
we just helped work in some different, different wrinkles on it that allowed it so you could produce from these very impermeable rocks. When we were doing it, I had no, I, at the time, I had no idea that most oil and gas was in jail. I was just, well, it's a worse rock. You need a denser frac network. You know, we try this, try that. And um, so it turned out to work. And so the, the result of it was a huge growth in US natural gas production. Right? US was building big import terminals to bring liquefied natural gas to the US. We import a lot of gas from Canada. Natural gas prices were high, driving up electricity prices. A lot of US manufacturing was you know, going to China because labor is cheaper. But, but, uh, and, and the energy costs were about the same. So what's happened is with a huge amount of natural gas in the US now, our energy costs have gotten very cheap. So even though our labor costs are higher, our energy costs are cheaper. So a fair amount of manufacturing is coming back to the US. Um, and it's, I could go on and on about these things. Then we, five or seven years later, it moved to oil. Now US oil production has grown crazy fast and you've seen crashed oil prices. Um, and I don't cry about that. I'm, I'm in that business, so yes, it hurts. But business is all about trying to supply consumer needs or consumer wants, which change all the time. But the primary beneficiaries of innovation in a market economy are always consumers, always. We're fighting hard, and of course, people that are good are making money, but the majority of the benefits, oil last year, the total world oil was a little over $1 trillion cheaper than it was the year before. So that's about, that's about $700 for every man, woman, and child in the world. Now, obviously, the poorest people don't consume $700, $700 of oil, but it's, it's, to me, when, when the, the necessities of life, food, energy, housing, if they become cheaper, standard of livings rise. Um, but that's the long-winded of what the shale revolution is. So when you have something disruptive that's caused this, you know, American oil production peaked in 1970 and declined until eight years ago. So it declined for 62 years, and now it's shot back up to the peak it was at uh, uh, 30, 38 years ago, there's opposition. You know, hey, this is something. This is something different, and so there's all sorts of opposition in our industry. I've done TV shows debating anti-frac activists. I've spoken in front of all many groups, as I'm doing now. But let me just say, everything has trade-offs. Every I, I worked on. I, I said briefly on fusion energy. I worked on solar energy in graduate school. I worked on geothermal energy for years afterwards. I love all kinds of energy. Um, so the shale revolution. What are our trade-offs? You know, if you, if you have a bucolic farm in western Pennsylvania and the Marcellus Shale is found as it was there, a lot of trucks on the, tr there's a lot of trucks on the road now. Um, there's, you got to take a few acres and level the trees and build a well pad. There's dust, there's dirt, there's noise. Um, it's, you know, they build a Starbucks right next to you. It's pretty annoying the six months they're building it. You know, after the fact, it's great. But there's definitely human impacts from it. Now, the scary ones, let's talk about them. To me, the, the, the dominant ones are, these, are the very human, very visible ones. And they are very real. We've developed, I have a new company to develop ways to carry sand that's in containers so we get rid of the dust. Um, we, we bury pipelines now so we can take rid of a huge amount, get rid of most of the trucks, but all sorts of trade-offs. But the scary ones we hear about is, is, is it polluting our water? We're injecting these chemicals underground, and they're going to seep up and go into the groundwater. Um, the EPA, as you probably know, did a big study on this for multiple years, and I think two or three years ago came out with their, it does not cause contamination of groundwater. If you spill a chemical on the surface and it leaks into the water, that will cause contamination of groundwater. But fractures from underground growing up, they don't, and the reason they don't is they're so deep. You know, we're producing oil from rocks that are probably 6,000 to 16,000 feet under the ground. And think of oil and gas. Right? Think, think of your soda pop. That's gas. That's carbon dioxide in your soda. Those bubbles come up pretty quickly. If oil and gas is underground, and it can, if it can float up to the surface, it would have done so 100 million years ago. Because there's lots of impermeable rocks. In fact, in the 90s, I worked a lot with some environmental groups on waste disposal. Instead of taking the drill cuttings from an offshore oil platform and carrying it over to land, just inject it underground because that's so far removed from the surface. There was a move to get refinery waste. To me, the most isolating place you can get on the surface of the earth is to inject it deep underground. 
Our landfills now, there's an inch of plastic between hazardous chemicals and groundwater. Now, that works. We've got monitors and all that, but an inch of plastic is nothing compared to a mile of mostly impermeable rock. But the earthquake one's different. And so what our industry has done there is installed water monitoring wells before development is done. You can monitor it. Colorado State University has a huge network in Weld County in Colorado where they continuously monitor water quality all around. Um, so there, whatever, a lot of science, a lot of data on that. But some of the scary things you hear simply aren't true. And some of them are partially true. And some of them are totally true. So the earthquake one is real. Let me explain the earthquake one. When we inject fluid underground, it's a rock. It's a solid rock. So that pressure has to get high enough. So if you're an engineer, to get above the confining stress, you've got to split that rock, and then the fluid drives through, and you grow this crack. Think, think of these cracks. They're maybe of order a quarter or a half inch wide. You can do sort of volumetrics for how much you pump underground. My original company, we measured how long do these fracks grow. You know, They grow maybe a few hundred, maybe a thousand feet or more long. They don't go quite as tall because the different layers are more barriers to growth, but they may go three, four, five, six hundred feet tall. But if they grow six hundred feet tall and you're ten thousand feet below the earth, you're still nine thousand four hundred feet below the surface. Um, but when you produce oil and gas, not just with the shale production, but with any oil and gas production, you also produce water. In fact, the US produces maybe two or three times as much water as we produce oil from deep underground. So when you get that water up to the surface, it's very salty. It's brine. It's more, more, more salty than the ocean. It's got all, it could have heavy metals in it. It could have norm, which is normally occurring radioactive materials that's in shale. It has, it has stuff that's nothing like clean water or nice surface waters. So you've got to dispose of that water. And truly, the best way to dispose of it is to inject it deep underground, basically back where it came from. But if you inject it deep underground, in a location near where there's faults, where there's, you know, what an earthquake is, is the solid earth moves, right? Cal East, Eastern California is sliding south. The coastal California is sliding north. That's the San Andreas Fault. So it's solid rock that's creeping by each other. So all over, different places are seismically active or less or more, but Oklahoma is, is, is the worst example for us in the industry. In Oklahoma, there's, these, there's the basement rocks, granite, think of Yosemite, big, solid, hard rocks. Those are the rocks in which big faults form and in which all the earthquakes you can feel come from. So most earthquakes come from many miles underground, much deeper than where we're drilling oil and gas wells. But there is a place where the top of the sedimentary rocks that we produce oil and gas from interfaces with the basement rocks. So in Oklahoma, those basement rocks aren't very deep. You know, maybe 12,000 feet deep. And they are injecting water at 11,800 feet deep into a very permeable rock, so it's, which means they can inject it and the water goes away easily. They've been doing it for many, many years. But recently, with the huge growth in oil production in Oklahoma, they're now putting huge amounts of water underground into this formation called the Arbuckle. And that water spreads out. It leaks into faults from the hard, solid basement rock, faults that have been stable because there's enough pressure to keep them apart. Once you put water in there, you're reducing the pressure across the rock, and eventually these rocks slip. And so in, in, in Oklahoma, the disposal of produced water from fracked wells is creating hundreds, thousands of earthquakes. Now, most of these earthquakes, they're magnitude one or two. That's unusual. Earth, Oklahoma doesn't have many of those but you can't feel them at the surface. It takes about magnitude three for you to feel it at the surface. But uh, a few weeks ago, there was a magnitude four earthquake in Oklahoma. So the town shook and things fell off the shelves. I mean, this is real impact on human civilization. And it should not happen. It is, it is all businesses are run by humans and humans are imperfect. Um, our industry for a while said, that isn't us. That, my, my, Surely that's not us. We've been injecting underground for a long time. But it is, it is us, because that injection has gotten so high. And uh, now there's instrumentation out. You put instrumentation on the ground. You can determine where these earthquakes are coming from. 
You can, if you start injecting water underground in a seismically active area, you'll make small earthquakes and then bigger earthquakes and they'll build up. You can see long before you're gonna create an earthquake that would move the surface. But our industry in Oklahoma has had the head in the sand attitude and um, they said it wasn't us. I think now it's accepted that we are indeed causing it. And so there's, there's a government being involved. To me, the best solution is just the property rights solution. If you, if you make an impact, you create an earthquake and you destroy something, you're responsible for that damage. And if someone gets seriously injured, that damage could be gigantic and it's uncertain. And if that causality is, is understood and reflected in the law, people won't inject into that zone anymore because they, they shouldn't. And I believe that that stoppage will happen, but if there's one thing I worry the most about the shale revolution, that's it, earthquakes. There was this problem in eastern Ohio as well. Uh, I think it quickly got observed, like that's a problem, that wasn't happening before. So they inject in different zones, they inject higher up. Um, so it's actually not a very hard problem to solve, but to solve a problem, you have to have people that are motivated and willing to go and solve it. Because the real solution is gonna raise the cost of disposing of water, but not giantly. We were talking earlier with the economics crowd here, and it's one of these, com these problem of the commons, where if you've got, if, if I say, man, I'm not doing that, I'm not causing any earthquakes, I'm not injecting my water there, I'm gonna inject it in a different zone, I've gotta buy pumps, I gotta spend more money to inject my water, but I want no part of causing that problem. My costs will go up a lot, and the problem won't go away because everybody else is still injecting into that zone. Um, so to get a solution, you know, nobody wants to be the one to do it unless everyone else does it, and, and no one's forcing everyone else to do it. It could be law or regulations. It could simply be uh, liabilities. But the government of Oklahoma is involved. I've been speaking outwardly about this for, for three or four years. They're involved, I think they'll fix that problem. I hope they fix that problem before somebody gets injured from what's going on deep underground. In general, as I say, what's great about us is when you produce something at the surface, you know, there's, we got maybe at most 10 feet of soil at the surface times the surface area of the earth. I mean, that's a giant area. But when you talk about stuff underground, you've got the same circumference, same surface area of the earth, but you've got miles thick of rock. So there's just a gigantic volume, which is why uh, resources from underground um, are very, very unlikely ever to, ever to exhaust um, a fishery on the surface. When something's finite and on the surface, we can exhaust it or run out of it or overstress it. But people ask me, you know, when are we gonna run out of oil and gas? And, and, and the clearly definitive answer to that is never. Um, a million years from now, let's say 100,000 years from now, or 1,000 years from now, way more than 90% of all the oil and natural gas will still be underground. It, it, it likely, 90, 90 plus percent of it will be underground forever. And it'll be, it'll be just like uh, the end of the Stone Age, which wasn't because we ran out of stones, it's because we found something different. You know, we didn't, we didn't end the horse and buggy age because we ran out of horses and buggies. They got displaced by something better. And I think that's the history of energy, and that will certainly be the history of energy here. Oil and gas, if you look at, I'm, I'm, as an energy nerd, if you look at sort of our energy situation, I think it's quite likely they'll still be the dominant source of energy probably for the rest of this century. You think, oh, it's five years or 10 years, and I, I spent five years working on the end of oil and gas. But re realistically, it's, they're probably gonna be around for a long time. But their use will eventually peak It'll decline because better things will displace it. Better things will displace them. Very long answer to that, but yeah. What do you think about the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere? Are we going to run out of habitable environment? Will that be what precipitates the next innovation, the required innovation? Are we going to run out of habitable, stable climate, arable land, rainfall? Are we going to run out of that? Fantastic question. So I gave a talk this morning at Elon University on climate change. So this is something I've spoken on for maybe a dozen years. But in my business, I said that original company called Pinnacle Technologies, we developed these technologies to measure the motion of fluid underground. So about 15 years I got, ago, I got a new business line, and it was CO2 sequestration. Lawrence Livermore National Labs, 
Lawrence Berkeley Labs, a number of national labs were testing, can we remove CO2 from the atmosphere and inject it underground? Um, and the short answer is it's expensive. Um, but, but we get paid to monitor that, make sure that CO2 doesn't you know, find a large fissure and make its way back up to the surface or into groundwaters. Um, but so CO2 in the atmosphere is about 280 parts per million pre-industrial time, so 200 years ago, 1,000 years ago, about 280 parts per million, so 0.3%, roughly, roughly 0.03%. By burning hydrocarbons, we've risen it from 280 parts per million to about 400 parts per million, so about a 40% increase. Um, and it's a greenhouse gas, which means CO2 absorbs infrared radiation, which is how the Earth cools itself. It absorbs that, it readmits it, some of it goes back down to the ground, um, <coughs> and it causes a warming. Um, I, I could go on for the subject forever, but the, it's a, so it's an issue, it's a problem. There's a lot of people involved in it, including myself on this study. Definitely the plant is warming, definitely it'll likely continue to warm. Um, is it the greatest environmental threat versus a bunch of other environmental threats? Is it a huge issue? You know, my, my short, short answer to that is the problem's not nearly as big or, or real as I thought it was. It is a real issue. It's absolutely going on. But the degree of modest warming we've had so far, the Earth, the Earth has warmed 0.9 degrees, a little less than 1 degree in 160 years. And the rate of warming today is not much different than the rate of warming before human CO2 emissions, maybe 30% faster. Maybe we're warming, we warmed a little less than one degree per century the last 150 years. The rate of warming right now is a little more than one degree per century. Um, so I think it's a big question, but, but is it, as a, as, a, as a long time environmentalist, is it our biggest environmental challenge? I'm not a believer that it is, but we should continue to monitor the data and do it. But between clean water, between habitats, um, between indoor air pollution, malaria. Of the problems that face the world, it's one of them, but I'm not sure it's high on the list, in my opinion. And uh, hi, I'm Andrew Bladen. Um, I'm in the MA program here, and uh, I went to Washington Lee University undergrad. You spoke a little bit about carbon sequestration, and I was wondering, as somebody that owns a geoscience firm, do you see carbon sequestration as being a viable commercial activity in the next 20 to 30 years? Um, obviously, there are People that are geoscientists now, they're involved in oil and gas, and potentially, you know, if there was an, a technology to interrupt that, maybe it, you spoke that you think it would be way down the line, but maybe if it was in 20 or 30 years, do you think that's a viable thing that geoscientists could potentially one day get into? You know, there's, there's a fair amount of work on it in the U.S. and in the U.K. and some other places. You know, my personal belief, and again, all these views are my personal views. I, I, don't, I don't know the future. I don't know the answer. My bet is not. Because um, think of the simplest hydrocarbon, methane, right? It's one carbon atom. It's four hydrogens, right? So the atomic weight of that molecule is 16. When we burn methane, we combine it with oxygen, and the products are CO2 plus H2O, right? You get two water molecules. You get one CO2 molecule. But that CO2 molecule weighs two and a half times as much as the methane molecule that was burnt. Um, so the volume of CO2 you would have to sequester compared to all the hydrocarbons that are burnt, it's gigantic. It's gigantic. Um, again, it would be great for my business. We have technologies for monitoring that and doing that. Um, there's certainly little bits of it going on. Um, you know, if this turns out, so I'd say it's possible, but I think it's a stretch. I think the economics of it look really, really tough. Um, I should say on CO2 real quick, the shale revolution that I've talked about, right, what, the, the bottom line has been, you know, more oil and cheap oil and more natural gas. So in the United States, 20 years ago, we got a little more than 50% of our electricity from coal. Natural gas supplied about 12%. Um, nuclear was a little less than 20. Hydro was several percent. Um, oil had essentially been phased out. Um, high, all, all renewables were 7% of energy. They're more than that of electricity. Um, hydro being the biggest component, biomass after that. But CO2 emissions in the US, because of this shale revolution, were basically burning a lot more natural gas and a lot less coal. And it's caused a pretty significant reduction in US CO2 emissions. In fact, last year, on a per capita basis, 
CO2 emissions in the United States were lower than any year since I was born, since I've been born. So the shale revolution, this sort of gas thing, has caused US did not sign the Kyoto Protocol. We're one of the very few countries that actually met that target. We didn't agree to that target. We didn't do it by a government policy, just economic innovation. You know, a new energy source became cheaper that happened to have half the CO2 per unit of energy of coal. Um, so it's, it's driven it down, but uh, the biggest driver of global CO2 emissions by far and away now is the growth in Asia. Um, uh, gigantic, it's you know, 3x the US and rising where ours is declining. But so I get asked, well, shouldn't, we, shouldn't the shale gas revolution be in China, or aren't there other things we can do? And like everything, there's trade-offs. But when I give these shale revolution talks, which I haven't given tonight, I, I, I would often close and say that, in my view, the last 20 years, the MVP of world energy has not been the US shale revolution. In my opinion, the last 20 years, the MVP of world energy has been coal. And the reason it's been coal is if you go back 20 years ago, there was about 2 billion people with no access to electricity. Zero. If you don't have access to electricity, very hard to have clean water. You can't refrigerate medicines. You can't do whatever. Um, and as coal has spread in the third world, about 800 million people have gotten electricity that did not have it before. Um, and what is it replacing? We think of coal as dirty, and coal is dirtier than oil, and oil is dirtier than natural gas, and nuclear is cleaner than all of them. So all things have trade-offs. But if you look at, I showed a slide this morning of the picture of the border between Haiti and the Dominican Republic. So look at an aerial photograph of the island of Hispanola. The western, you can, it's one of the few national boundaries you can see from space. If you're in the Dominican Republic, it's a lush rainforest. I mean, it's in the Caribbean, after all. Right at the border with Haiti, it's dry, dusty, and almost completely deforested. Why is that? Because in Haiti, they live the way our their energy source is the same as our ancestors. They burn grass, stick, trees, and dung. Um, the Dominican Republic has diesel, coal, doesn't have natural gas, but it has hydrocarbons that produces electricity. They don't need to get power to, to cook their food and heat their homes by chopping down the forests. If you look historically, I, I go, I, I've been to England a number of times. In fact, I testified in the House of Lords on this shale revolution that they're debating in England. England is super lush and wet. It's green. Think of your picture of England. Almost completely deforested. England was deforested because economic growth in the Industrial Revolution began before coal was up to speed. They lost all of their forests. Western Europe has huge forests all throughout it because coal arrived in time to save their forests. So hydrocarbons have a human impact absolutely on the world in many ways, including by increasing the CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, human agriculture has a gigantic impact on the world. So all things we do have an impact on the world. It's always about trade-offs. But coal, compared to what it came before it historically and what, what comes before it in poor geographic locations, coal is dramatically cleaner than what it's displacing. Yes? What do you think the most viable green energy source will be in the future? Um, uh, you know, well, there's hydropower, I think, has been fantastic. It's now very out of fashion because nobody wants to build a new dam. And of course, well, everything impacts, impacts land and impacts people. So I'm not even, but of those, I would say solar. Solar is very tiny percent of world energy today, but it's going to grow. It's going to grow very, very significantly because it has a significant power density. Um, it's fantastic for remote villages in Africa that aren't on the grid. Now, batteries are still expensive, but that'll change. So I think solar will play a big role in remote areas. I think in sunny areas, it'll play a role producing electricity. Wind, wind, I think, is the other extreme. Wind takes a giant amount of land to produce a very small amount of intermittent power. Wind today is basically a reverse Robin Hood scheme. We have all the rate payers and taxpayers paying extra money so wealthy people can get guaranteed government returns to put up wind farms. But I think when those subsidies end, Peak wind will arrive probably in the next 10 or 20 years. 
In, in England, that went all in for wind. You cannot permit another wind farm onshore in England. You know, people, it's, you know, they're in every, on every vision, every whatever, the visual, the light pollution. So they're building them offshore. And the example I gave when I testified there was all of the wind power in England, which is as much as the populace will agree to onshore, and then the offshore wind, it all together produces less energy than 100 acres in Pennsylvania of shale gas. So wind, the land, the money, the cost, I think is not long-term viable. Solar is. Um, I think in the very long run, fusion will be huge. Um, but there's probably stuff we haven't even thought of that will be big. Um, back to CO2. Yes. Sequestering. Um, I wanted to know if you I guess it's more of a proposal um, as far as the sequestering of carbon and then what? Um, what about soil fertility or reincorporating that into agriculture and creating more fertile soil, better plants, better food? But by what mechanism? That? Creating? The carbon in roots that dies and creates soil. And oh, yes. The ground and stays there. Oh, yeah. A ab absolutely. And in fact, this is this is... Also kind of interesting science from observational technologies. Um, the, planet, the planet has greened meaningfully in the last 20 or 30 years. When I was in college, I went to Africa, and there was a concern then that the Sahara Desert was growing, and it was. It was growing south. It was, it was a big concern about desertification. And this is just one of many factors, but because of this 40% increase of plant food in the air, we've had a significant increase in agricultural productivity beyond just better fertilizers and better crops, the planet is greening. So the Sahel, south of the Sahara, is so there's more biologic matter today than there has been in the past, which is why the atmospheric increase in CO2, it goes up by about half as much as we burn. So we burn and put CO2 in the atmosphere. About half of that gets absorbed in biologic plant matter and into the oceans, and half of it stays in the atmosphere. Um, and so, you know, uh, growth of plant matter obviously is key. And I mean, obviously, it was existing before, but it is, it is being accelerated a little bit. And that is where a fair amount of the CO2 is going. The whole question on, on, on climate change, that the simple math of we were at 280 parts per million. We've gotten to 400 today on the current path, which, of course, won't happen, but you don't, we don't know. So if you followed the current path, we'd probably be at about 560 parts per million by the end of this century, so 85 years from now we would have a doubling of CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, the simple physics of that, it leads to a little over one degree of warming, 1.3 degrees C with no feedback effects. We've had about 0.9 degrees C, so we'd have four tenths of a degree to go for the rest of this century. From economists, even in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change thing, that would un unquestionably be a mild positive for society. More people die of cold than die of warm, it increases food production. Blah, blah, blah. The question about climate change, that, that it might become a big issue, is positive feedback. If that warming from CO2 actually causes more water to evaporate, which it absolutely does, it, when the planet is warmer, it's wetter. During the dinosaur times, the planet was dramatically warmer than today, far more CO2 in the atmosphere, and very wet and lush. When the planet's colder, it's drier. So as we get warmer, and we have been getting warmer, that creates more water vapor that rises into the air. The question is, what happened to that water vapor? If that water vapor just forms additional clouds and rains out, then that's no feedback effect. We'll get another half a degree warming in the next century, and maybe a mild positive, but not a meaningful impact on the planet. If instead that water vapor stays in the air, water vapor is a much more important greenhouse gas than CO2. So if you increase water vapor in the air, that could make this a little over one degree warming be two, three, four, or five degrees. And that higher end, that's a big impact. That's a big impact. So the technical question is all about feedback effect. Is there positive feedback? Will we get the worst case warming or the warming we hear about that would be scary? Um, and so that's a, it's a very interesting technical question. I would say the data today is slowly showing more and more that there doesn't appear to be much feedback, but we, we only know the past to today. We do not know the future. So very interesting scientific question. Definitely trade-offs involved. I think we're probably 
all and, and you, we can talk more of at the reception. So I have good news. I have good news for everybody. We have a reception immediately following this, um, and Mr. Wright will be there for you. Be there for us. Absolutely. Thank you for the fascinating discussion. I hope you accept this. Thank you. Please join me in welcoming and thanking Mr. Wright.